Since mid-2014, no issue has dominated our national conversation about race more than the relationship between poor police and minority communities, and especially poor minority communities. This controversy began, um, in many respects, in Ferguson, Missouri, when a white police officer, Darren Wilson, killed an unarmed black man, Michael Brown, and Ferguson exploded in riots. Yet this incident was quickly followed by a series of other deaths of unarmed African-American men at the hands of white police officers, many of which incidents gained national attention. The popular response to these incidents is not just a knee-jerk reaction to the brutality now available for our viewing on YouTube. For years, scholars on both ends of the political spectrum have stressed the racial inequities in our criminal justice system. Most prominently, Michelle Alexander of Ohio State University has called mass incarceration a new Jim Crow, describing it as a racialized system of social control with very striking and substantial similarities to the earlier caste system. Some statistics lend credibility to her claims. The number of people incarcerated in the United States has increased sevenfold since the early 1980s from approximately 300,000 people to over 2 million. The US locks up a higher percentage of citizens in almost every developed country in the world. In Germany, the statistic um, relevant to this number is 93 citizens per 100,000 people. In the United States, that number is 750, six to 10 times higher than other industrial nations. Drug convictions account for a very strong um, percentage of the increase in incarceration. These drug convictions disproportionately involve African Americans, even though whites and blacks use um, and sell drugs at the same rates. There's a number of studies that have consistently shown that the drug use rate is the same across those races. Yet, in some states, black men are admitted to prison on drug charges at 10 to 50 times the rate of white men. And in some areas, like Washington, D.C., three out of four African American men can expect to spend some time in prison during their lifetime. Those are extraordinary numbers. This issue is of personal interest to me beyond the national conversation. Since my arrival at Wheaton about four years ago, my wife and I have lived and worshiped in Lawndale, which is a lower income African American neighborhood in the west side of Chicago, with some of the highest rates of both crime and incarceration in the city of Chicago. Living in a neighborhood like this has changed the way that I think about these statistics and the way that I think about terms like criminal or felon. When I think of felon or criminal, the people will get labeled that way I picture a 15-year-old boy who plays basketball in my back alley and doesn't mind when my two-year-old son runs through his game and will give him the ball when he asks. I picture men who have pretty serious and obvious mental health issues and really do not need to be incarcerated would respond much more positively to counseling and mental health services. I picture 50, 60-year-old men in my Bible study that I attend every Thursday morning who, yes, have made mistakes and, yes, regret them, but have gotten out of prison, have sought to get their lives back on track, now are holding a steady job, have gotten reconciled with their families, are trying to be a good husband, trying to be the father that they weren't before for their children, but reconciling with their kids and trying to get involved with their lives again. These are real faces. These are real names. Yes, there are mistakes in their background, but they also grew up in extraordinarily adverse circumstances that, but for the grace of God, I absolutely could have fallen into the same circumstances. And I cannot help but look at those faces and think of those names and wonder, when I think about these statistics, is this the best way to respond to crime in my neighborhood? Is this the only way that we respond to those who have made mistakes, to banish them from society? And as a professor of theology, I can't help but ask, what does theology say about this kind of situation? What does God's word and the Christian tradition have to say about this morass? And what I've discovered is that actually theology has quite a lot to say about the things that I've been witnessing, even as what I've witnessed has brought a lot of my formerly head in the clouds, ivory tower, academic theology to life. So what I'd like to share with you today is how the primary object of my study, St. Augustine, a fifth century bishop from North Africa, has helped me to understand systemic evils like mass incarceration and what I think he offers as potential solutions. In short, very simply, I think Augustine helps us to see mass incarceration as ultimately derivative of a spiritual problem that implicates all of us more than we would like to admit, and that it also demands a spiritual solution that all of us have to get involved with more than we might want to acknowledge. I'd like to begin my reflections on Augustine in something of an unexpected place, which is his polemic against Roman religion. 
I'd like to highlight three points that he makes about Roman religion before connecting this to mass incarceration. First, Roman religion is an intellectual absurdity that ultimately derives from a lust for earthly goods. The basic system of the gods was designed to secure earthly benefits. If you pleased and worshiped the gods, if you burned incense to them, made a sacrifice to them, they would give you earthly stuff. If you displeased or didn't worship the gods or refused to bow down to them, they might hurt you in earthly ways. They might not protect you. They might not give you a harvest. They might send a famine or a plague. In principle, Augustine will say, the idea that different gods could control different aspects of nature, could control different material goods, in principle, maybe that's true, maybe it makes sense. But once you start to examine the system a little bit more closely, once you start to look at it in a little bit more detail, the whole system starts to break down. As Augustine recounts with fastidious scorn, the Romans have three gods for corn, one for the seeds, one for the shoots, one for reaping and harvesting. Are the gods so weak that you can't have just one god to grow corn? There is a goddess named Felicity. Another word for that is happiness. But happiness is, according to the classical philosophical definition, that which you seek for your own sake and for the sake of which you seek other things. So if you have a goddess named Felicity, or basically happiness, why would you need any other gods? Because whatever the other gods could secure you, you should already be able to get through the goddess happiness, since if you need it to be happy, she'll get it for you. So what you see is that Roman religion is not a co coherent, conceptually, intellectually robust system. It is an ad hoc fiction, and what it's really driven by is a lust for earthly goods. Number two, massive systems of evil do not rely on shocking levels of depravity or malice, but fairly pedestrian, understandable combination of self-interested utilitarianism and apathy. It does not require masses of massively wicked people, but just a bunch of people who act in their self-interest out of utilitarian and apathetic motives. Augustine will ultimately attribute Roman religion to the demons who seek to destroy humanity in their jealousy of us and seek to receive worship from us in their overweening pride. But the demons don't possess the people to worship them. They only prompt them. And humans are ultimately to blame for their own decisions. And so when you're looking at humans, how are they to blame for their, um, their idolatry? That leaves you with the elites and the masses. The elites for Augustine know, this is the politicians, the philosophers, the poets, the literary um, elite. The elites know that the gods are a fiction, but they sustain the system for pragmatic reasons. They see it as valuable for ensuring political civil stability, and they fear that if they were to challenge the status quo, they might lose their own position of power because people are attached to their popular superstition. The elites don't really care about the gods. They're not really interested in maintaining the system for its own sake. It's just a mechanism to secure what they really care about, which is political stability and their own power, their own comfort, their own prestige. The masses do believe in the gods, and they are culpable for this because they should have seen that the gods are immoral and that they're not worthy of worship. They believe in the gods, and they're prone to manipulation toward the gods because it is the best way for them to get earthly goods, so they think. So they're driven by lust for earthly goods to worship the gods, even though they should have known better. But they are being deceived by both elites and demons. They didn't come up with the gods. They're not perpetuating the stories. They're not manipulating the people to worship. All they're doing is taking at face value what the politicians, the poets, the philosophers are saying. Yes, they made themselves prone to manipulation, but they're really just doing what everybody else is doing. So is that so bad? For Augustine, yes, there's demons involved, and they're pretty bad. But the elites and the masses are ultimately responsible and they are acting in ways that are pretty understandable. It's not driven by horrible, shockingly wicked motives. They're just looking out for themselves. They make a couple of compromises along the way. And they don't really think about how it affects others. Third, the same impulse that gives rise to idolatry is the impulse that gives rise to violence and oppression. This is not just about idolatry. This is about violence. It's about the oppression of marginalized people groups. Rome's history is almost defined by its involvement with military combat. It's almost the defining theme of its entire narrative. Rome, as Augustine recounts, citing Roman authors, began as a small city that had to defend itself understandably against outside attack. It was a defensive protective measure. But once they won and they sort of defeated the outside attackers, 
they thought, well, we're actually pretty good at war. Why don't we start to take on some other people? And they went to more and more wars to expand their territory. They got more and more aggressive. And they fought these massive, massive wars with these massive, massive enemies. After the last Punic War, Rome had basically won. There was no real rival around the Mediterranean. They were complete. And so what, what did they do with their formerly violent impulse? Because there's no one really to attack anymore. They turned that aggressive violent impulse within, such that there was class warfare that now arose, so that the elites oppressed the peasants and the poor. When Rome could have enjoyed peace, they instead suffered civil war. And yet the savagery that the Romans inflicted against fellow citizens was worse than anything that they had ever suffered at the hands of foreign people. And so what you see in Augustine is that idolatry and violence arise from the same impulse. Both come from a lust for earthly goods. You create gods to get earthly stuff. You create a god of corn to get corn. You create a god of victory to get military victory. You go to war to also get stuff. You go to war to get other people's territory, to get their money, to get slaves. Indeed, for Augustine, the entire history of humanity outside of God reflects this basic pattern. Humanity is constantly divided against itself as the powerful oppress the weak, as one people group tries to destroy another or at least enslave it. So violence and injustice are not an accidental feature of humanity after the fall. They are the natural, organic, social manifestation of a collective decision to prioritize earthly goods above God. How does this analysis apply to the original topic, mass incarceration and the issues that we face of race and injustice today? Is mass incarceration also not driven by the shocking depravity and malice of masses of people, but simply by pedestrian factors like utilitarianism, apathy, and lust for earthly gain. I'd like to draw here, especially on William Stuntz, who was a former Harvard Law professor who passed away um, an untimely death um, at an early age, but was also a conservative evangelical and wrote about his struggles with cancer in a prominent way in Christianity today. I'm mostly going to base what follows off his narrative, though I will also be drawing from other sources. According to William Stuntz, the collapse of American criminal justice, which is the title of his book, is actually mostly a function of social fragmentation. Not exclusively, but this is a very critical issue. It's a function of social fragmentation. As he uh, recounts, the criminal justice system in its current form is a function of two major migrations, one in the late 1800s and the other in the early 1900s. Um, by criminal justice system, I'm talking about the police, judges, juries, prosecutors, defense attorneys. How did that arise? Two major migrations, one in the late 1800s, primarily of Europeans who arrive at northern cities. Um, this is when the Irish, the Italians, the Polish, the Russian come over. And the other of African Americans who are moving from the south to the north in the Great Migration um, in the early 1900s through about the middle of the century. Both of these times, um, both of these major migrations resulted in a rise in violent crime. But this is the difference, as Stunts recounts, between the European immigration of the 1800s and the African American migration of the 1900s. When Irish moved to America and they populated the major cities, they experienced, they experienced a crime wave. But the justice system that was developed was populated primarily by the Irish. You had Irish police officers, Irish judges, Irish juries, Irish defense attorneys. If you have an Irish jury and a prosecutor and police officer, yes, they are fully willing to send an Irish criminal to jail. They are willing to exercise justice on the Irish in their own Irish community that are causing problems. But they also have a basic sympathy and understanding toward the communities that they're overseeing. They don't conclude that the Irish have an inherent tendency toward crime because they're Irish. Various religious government social agencies initiate a series of benevolent efforts to address the harsh immigration conditions that are providing a fertile ground for crime. Crime is seen as a problem that can be addressed by addressing the social conditions that are causing the crime. When African Americans moved north and crime went up, there was a very different reaction. All the white people moved out. What happened after white flight, though, was that the fairly affluent suburbanites who moved from the cities out to the, uh, to the suburbs retained control over the criminal justice system, such that those who are now policing lower income African-American communities did not have native understanding or sympathy toward the communities they were policing. 
and they actually seemed to presume that the primary solution to the black problem with crime was not benevolent government, social, or religious efforts, but to throw everybody in prison. If Stunts is right, and social fragmentation is one of the driving factors behind mass incarceration, then where do you locate this blame? How do you result in a situation where the police and minority communities so fail to understand each other, crime remains a problem, but the people do not turn to the police in trust or for help, but they actually feel like they're out to get them even when they're not doing anything wrong? Whom do we blame for this? Well, the easy answer might be all the white people who moved in the 50s and 60s from my neighborhood, okay? So maybe we can go with that. But if you study the history of housing discrimination in the history of Chicago, in, in, in Chicago and other places and other urban centers in the country, the story is significantly more complicated than every white person who left these neighborhoods during that time period was simply a racist. There were, for sure, some bad actors. The Federal Housing Agency, for instance, instituted this notoriously racist practice called redlining, where they refused to back up mortgages for neighborhoods with only a small population of black residents. That was straight up racist. It was ended in the 1970s. That was a bad thing. There were blockbusters who played on people's fears because of this policy, telling white people that they would never be able to sell their homes if a black person moved into their neighborhood and were able to manipulate them into selling very quickly at very low rates and then flip, uh, and they were able to flip those properties and to sell it for a huge profit. There were blockbusters that you know, pushed white people out. They were pretty bad. But a lot of the folks would have been fine with an African American friend, wouldn't have run away from blacks just because they were black. They didn't necessarily want to move. Moving is a big expense. It's a big problem. Why would you want to move? This is my house. This is where I grew up. Many of them simply saw the neighborhoods changing. They predicted quite reasonably that if African Americans moved in, property values would drop. And they decided that they should probably move before they would lose all their financial investment into their home. There were some people who tried to stem the tide and stayed as long as they could, but racial tension forced them out. I can think of friends who stayed for years after the Martin Luther King riots in 1968. They really tried to stay, but then their kids started getting beat up in the middle of all the racial tension. What are they supposed to do? The kids are grown up, they're still bitter. Why did you keep us in that neighborhood for so long? These issues are complicated. It's not easy to point to one villain. And these complexities make me loathe to judge a previous generation in a situation that I never experienced. I really do not know what I would have done in that situation. But Augustine does challenge me to ask, what does this mean now? If this history is something along the lines of true, if Stunts has an accurate reading of how these dynamics arose, and a lot of these dynamics arose through fairly understandable decisions by not that many malicious people, how does Augustine inform a contemporary response to mass incarceration? Let me conclude with a couple of admonitions that I think Augustine gives to us today. First, we do need to take more seriously the ways unreflective, pragmatic decisions may have larger systemic effects. Now, Augustine absolutely understands the importance of material goods. He is not saying that safety is a bad thing. He's not saying stability and good schools and money is a bad thing. These are gifts from God. They're actually very necessary to sustain us in this earthly, material, temporal existence. You are not supposed to pursue danger for its own sake. That's a sort of a self-defeating martyr complex. But Augustine is also very aware of how easily tempted we are to turn good things into gods, how we turn means into ends, how we make earthly things, which should be used for heavenly ends, into ends in and of themselves, forsaking heavenly goods in the process. And again, he warns us that massive systems of evil do not need shockingly evil people for their perpetuation. They just need a bunch of people who will go along with the crowd, make some compromises, and who won't speak up when other people are suffering injustices. I would suggest that an Augustinian analysis of systemic evil demands extending the scope of what we define to be Christian discipleship beyond personal piety to the fundamental structures by which we order our lives, and that we think about the way those decisions affect other people, where we live, where we send our kids to school, how we spend our money, whom we're willing to accept into our neighborhoods or even churches. These are deeply spiritual questions beyond just Bible and prayer. Bible and prayer are important, but we're limiting ourselves if we don't think about these broader systemic issues. Second, Augustine encourages us to cherish mercy, even for wrongdoers. In many respects, Augustine was a law and order guy. He encouraged respect for earthly authorities. 
He considered them important for maintaining civil peace. He even acknowledged, in principle, their right to wield the sword. But in a fascinating wide range of letters to civil authorities, he strongly encouraged them to leaven justice with mercy, especially when the officials are Christian. He encourages Roman officials to take seriously Jesus' command to love the enemy, turn your cheek, to imitate your Father in heaven who causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, who causes the rain to fall upon the righteous and the unrighteous. This is not going to undermine civil peace, he says. It actually establishes it. People respect their leaders more when they can balance justice and mercy. Historically, if you read our authors, the best Roman leaders were those who exercised flexibility and restraint and didn't just carry out vengeance upon other people to make them fear. And Christians of all judges, Christian judges, should remember that God is your ultimate judge and let him who is without sin cast the first stone. You're supposed to take that seriously in imperial office. One day, Augustine says, God will judge the world. That's true. He will divide the sheep and the goats to his left and to his right. He will send some off to eternal life and some off to eternal destruction. But that judgment is not for us to exercise now, and it is reserved for God, and it's reserved for after death. Our job as Christians, and even as civil magistrates, is to encourage wrongdoers while they have time to repent, to see their wrongdoing, and to change to get them on the right path, to encourage them, to challenge them, to discipline them, so that they can meet God in a positive way, lest they meet their maker in judgment after their death when there is no opportunity for return. Again, earthly authorities do have the right to exercise justice, but justice should be restorative, not punitive. It should seek to heal and not to hurt. It should act as a doctor and not as an executioner. Let me suggest that these two Augustinian admonitions that we need to challenge standard social structures, and that we need to cherish mercy actually go hand in hand. We cannot have mercy upon an abstraction. We need to see faces. We need to know names. We need to know the particulars. And once we do, we start to discover that we are not any more worthy of respect or dignity than those the world has banished from civil society. That we could have made the same exact mistakes if we were raised in those circumstances and that those who have made mistakes have quite a lot to teach us about grace, humility, repentance, and God's sovereignty. When that starts to happen, the last become first, and the first becomes last, and God starts to knit together a community of reconciled sinners. And so, if I may be permitted to conclude on a bit of hyperbole, an Augustinian analysis of systematic injustices is not just an intellectual exercise, it's actually a path into the very gospel where we can witness firsthand God's desire to restore humanity to its original purposes. And if I may be permitted to indulge in one more hyperbole, that's also the ultimate purpose of integrating faith and learning in a Christian liberal arts education. Thank you. Thank you.